Back when I started out in landscape photography, I just slapped a 10 stop filter on the front of my lens and long exposed everything. Two minutes, three minutes, the longer the better. Today I'm a little bit more deliberate about when I use the long exposure effect for landscape photography. In this week's video I'll discuss different cases of how I consider what shutter speed to choose in different circumstances of landscape photography. But let's start with the basics of shutter speed. So shutter speed is measured in seconds. So 1 over 20 means 1 over 20 seconds. 1 over 100, 1 hundredth of a second, 1 over 500, and all the way down to 1 four thousandths of a second. You can also go the other way, so you have like 1 third of a second, half a second, 1 second, and all the way up to usually 30 seconds. The longer the shutter speed, or also known as the slower the shutter speed you use, the longer the shutter in your camera is open for and the longer you expose for. Exposing basically means collecting light onto your sensor and the longer you expose for, the more light you collect and the brighter your photos become. You can compensate for this brightness by changing your aperture or your ISO. However, I'm not going to go into that in this video. So if you are a complete beginner and have no clue what I'm talking about, be sure to check out my 90% of landscape photography in 20 minutes video. Here I cover all these basics. So check it out via the link up in the corner. And let's start out with how it actually works. So in this scene here, there's a lot of stuff going on. And as you can see over on the left with the EXIF data, my shutter speed is one quarter of a second. So we have a girl here in front, she is standing still while everything around her is moving. We have a train, we have another girl and a boy in the background. So the girl and the boy in the background, they are moving and because they are moving and my shutter speed is relatively slow, they are being blurred. The same goes for the train. Even though the train is not moving particularly fast in this example here, it is getting dragged out, it's getting blurred because of the movement. Now in this video clip here, you can see there's a train driving over the screen. Let's repeat it again and again. But the point is that I'm videoing this train from a good distance. And because of this distance, the train is actually moving relatively slow over my frame, whereas in the picture, the train is moving fast over the frame because I'm close to it. So the distance between your camera and whatever it is is moving has a huge impact on how much blur there will be. So if we look at this example here from a waterfall, I've taken it at 0.5 seconds and you can see we have some streaks in the water. If I had halved the distance between the waterfall and the camera, then I would only need a quarter of a second shutter speed to get the same effect in the water, because we are counting that the individual droplet has to move over the frame. And if I half my distance to that individual droplet, then it will run over my frame in half the time it takes, as if I'm twice as far away from it. So that's how shutter speed actually works. You can also emulate shutter speed in many different ways. I made this video last week where I showed how to make a long exposure effect without filters. In this photo here, I have taken a 30 second exposure. However, I have taken six exposures and stacked them. And that gives the result of a three minute long exposure. And no, your base image does not have to be 30 seconds. It can also be 1 50th of a second. So here I have actually made a time lapse and then I have stacked all the photos at once. You can see they're a little bit jiggery up here in the corner. But because I stack them all, then I still get the effect of the long exposure with these clouds coming towards me. There are a few different places where the shutter speed actually doesn't matter a whole lot for landscape photography. So in this scene here, it's completely still. There's nothing moving. I could have used any shutter speed, everything from 30 seconds all the way up to one four thousandth of a second, and the shutter speed wouldn't have changed a 
thing. Same goes for this one here. Yes, I have a little bit of movement in the snow up here on top of the mountain, but even at one tenth of a shutter speed, we would not have been able to see a big difference. And I got this at one two hundredth of a second. Here, I got this shot at one sixtieth of a second, and we have the ocean actually moving. So if I had had a somewhat slower shutter speed, it would have been a little bit more blurry. But nevertheless, in this photo here, I have a huge spectrum of shutter speeds to actually shoot from or choose. Everything from one sixtieth of a second all the way to one four thousandth of a second, and it basically wouldn't have made a difference. In this example here, from a still morning in a forest, since nothing is moving, I can also just have a long shutter speed. In this example here, 0.3 seconds. So I'm going to show three different examples in this video where I am really using the long exposure effect and change my shutter speed. And the first example here is with seascapes. In this photo here, I'm having a really, really long shutter speed of 240 seconds. And as you can see, everything, the clouds and the waves, everything is just blurred completely out. In this example here, 30 seconds, I have a lot of waves coming in and they are getting blurred out. They're being like averaged out due to the longer shutter speed. So it looks like this foggy effect. Another 30 second example, you can actually see how some of the waves have come up on the beach and then come back out again. And due to all the sea spray and foam and so forth, it is also getting averaged out. If I take my shutter speed and take it very far down, so it's only like 1.6 seconds, then we can actually start seeing some streaks. We can start see some texture in these waves. 1.6 seconds is still relatively long, but compared to the previous photo, we can really see that texture. So the question is, if you want to show a little bit more texture and show a little bit more action, or you just want to blur it completely out. Here's another example where I used one second. The streaks are moving out or into the frame, actually away from me. And that gives this effect here. Same from the ice beach. When you want to capture long exposed waves or streaks coming back out on a beach, something like one third of a second to one second is usually what works really, really well. In this example here, I'm all the way down at one sixth of a second and it depends on how fast the water retreats back. This example here, four seconds, the water was actually very slow at coming back out into the ocean from this pool. So to get this very streaky effect, I needed a four second shutter speed. Here the waves are coming towards me, so I'm all the way down at 0.3 seconds, so about a third of a second. And because the waves are a little bit faster than in the previous examples, then you may want to consider to make a little bit of a faster shutter speed to actually capture some texture. And again, 0.3 seconds with waves coming in, crashing against some rocks, and there's so spray all over the place. You do not want to have too long of a shutter speed because then all these explosions over here will just be averaged out. You won't be able to see them. And it's the same case in this one here. It's a bad weather day, but nevertheless, 0.4 seconds. And you can even see here that the streaks are maybe a little bit more blurry than in the previous example here. So there's only 0.1 seconds between these two photos, but nevertheless, you can actually see that they have been pulled out or dragged out a little bit more. And then there's of course the examples where you really want to capture the crazy waves and capture the texture of them and just freeze the moment. Here's a good idea to have a really fast shutter speed. And as you can see, I've shot this one at one 160th of a second. And that might even be on a little bit of a slow side, but there was hardly any light here, so I had to find the best middle ground. So if you really want an ethereal effect, go for the 30 second plus. Usually I prefer to shoot between one sixth of a second and one second to capture the movement of the waves. Probably about one third of a second is usually what works the best for me. And if you really want to freeze time and capture the wave, then one one hundredth and a sixtieth of a second, or even faster, is definitely preferable. Like, the faster the better, basically. If you want to support this channel, and if you want to watch even more, be sure to like the video. It's highly appreciated, it pushes the video out to even more people. And subscribe if you want to watch 
even more. So other places where you want to make long exposures is in dark areas simply because you will need to compensate for the lack of light with a longer shutter speed. In this case here, from inside an ice cave, it was really, really dark. It doesn't look like that, but it's really dark in there. And I had to use an aperture of f11 to get everything sharp. That meant that I needed to have a really long shutter speed of 30 seconds. And I even had to up the ISO to 3200. And that actually gave me an exposure I could use. If you shoot the northern lights, which are of course during night, relative to the dark night sky, they can be rather bright. In this example here, I had a 20 second exposure and then the other EXIF data, as you can see. In this example here, they were stronger, so I could actually lower it to 6 seconds and shooting at f1.4, so it's really open aperture. And here, I upped the ISO a little bit, but could then lower the shutter speed. And in this photo here, I had a really, really strong burst of auroras. So I was all the way down at 1.6 seconds. So the auroras can really, really vary. And you really have to consider your shutter speed and your settings all the time. As I usually say, it's like a dance between Lady Aurora, you and your camera to, to get an optimal exposure. During night, you can also photograph the Milky Way. Generally, use the 500 rule. It says 500 divided by your focal length that gives you shutter speed. In this case here, it meant that I could have a shutter speed of 25 seconds, but because I was shooting here at an ISO variant camera, I really had to nail the ISO. So I put the ISO all the way up to ISO 5000 to get an optimal exposure. What you can do also, besides actually getting a proper exposure, is to make vertical panoramas or panoramas during night. So you take several photos and put them together. So even though you have a high ISO, all that individual grain will actually become smaller or more insignificant. In this example here, I had an ISO invariant camera. When it comes to ISO variants and ISO invariants, be sure to look it up on YouTube. It's quite an interesting technology, but ISO invariant cameras, the ISO does not really matter a whole lot. And in this photo here, I have used a lot of different techniques to get a really clear photo. So shot it with an ISO invariant camera. I made a panorama out of it and I even tracked the stars. So in that way, I could get a fairly clean photo. Forest environments are also usually really, really dark. So here you might actually have to up your shutter speed quite a lot. It's usually not an issue for me because I go out on silent mornings without any wind. So I can have long exposures without the leaves or branches moving because obviously if they move, then you get a blurred photo. So I can usually have a fairly long shutter speed and shoot at low ISOs to get clean photos. However, even when the sun is shining through the canopy and the sunshine outside the forest, you might still have to have a fairly slow shutter speed to get a proper exposure. As in this example here, one sixth of a second, that's relatively slow even though the sun is shining. So you generally do want to avoid going into a forest when, when there's wind and photograph in a forest when there's wind. So caves, you just have to compensate for the lack of light and figure out what works for you. Auroras, generally as slow a shutter speed as possible to capture their, the texture of the auroras. For Milky Ways, use the 500 rule maybe even use some of the more complicated rules. You can find them in the PhotoPills app. And for forests, generally avoid wind because then you can nullify how important shutter speed is. The last example is waterfalls and streams. So as I said in the beginning, when I started out in landscape photography, I just put a 10 stop filter on everything and just long exposed everything. So here we have a very long, long exposed waterfall. The problem with these very long, long exposed waterfalls is that you kind of lose the sense of drama and the sense of especially size because you can't see all those individual droplets. And you can also see here, even though I go all the way down to 0.8 seconds, we have beautiful streaks in the foreground, but the waterfall in the background Again, you don't really have a sense of how big it is. So in this classic example here from Skoafoss in Iceland, I wanted to just drag out the clouds and yeah, just get as long as an exposure as possible. And you don't really have a sense of that size. I can put a person in front, and even though I'm all the way down at 0.6 seconds, you can see that the waterfall in and of itself is also still very 
ethereal looking. You don't really have the texture and that sense of size besides that there's a person down there. But for this photo, I did choose 0.6 seconds because I wanted the effect of the water going around the waterfall. And I needed a li little bit of long exposure for that. Even if we go all the way down to half a second, we are still getting that long exposed view. But we are nearing a place where we can see some streaks. 0.4 seconds. This starts to work really, really well for me when it comes to the streaks. And that's basically the same as with the waves. But you can still see the waterfall in the background there. It looks beautiful, very ethereal, but you can't really see the texture of it. One fifth of a second. Here the water was running really, really fast. I was really, really close to it. So one fifth of a second was more than sufficient to get a very texture rich amount of streaks from this photo here. So all the way down at one two hundredth of a second, I really freeze time. And this is the same waterfall as the example before with 30 seconds. And for me, this works much better. Let's just ignore the light and so forth. But in regard to actually showing the size of the waterfall, we can now see the cascades of water as it breaks down through the air. Same goes for Skoa for us here. I'm close to it. And because I'm close to it, I need an even faster shutter speed, even though I'm shooting at a, at a wide angle. So one two hundredth of a second, and you can really see it, it becomes much more dramatic, less ethereal, it's more like, no, threatening somehow. And in this example here, because I'm zoomed all the way into probably like 200 millimeter or something like that, I need a very fast shutter speed to actually capture all the details of the waterfall. So one five hundredth of a second. It's very important when you really zoom in and you really want to get that crisp sense of water breaking in the air that you have a fast shutter speed. If you're a little bit in doubt whether you want a fast exposure to capture the details of the waterfall in the background, but you still kind of want the streaks in the foreground water, then you can always take two different exposures and combine them. I do this fairly often. So the background waterfall is big and you can really see the texture of it, yet you get those streaks in the foreground. So it becomes a little bit more ethereal and, and a little less detailed and chaotic. So here to summarize, a long exposure around a waterfall will give you this very ethereal effect. A shorter exposure will really capture all the texture and a very fast exposure becomes very chaotic. But if you can get the composition right, the fast exposure might actually be the one you prefer because you can actually see that it's really a waterfall. So to summarize, when I photograph big waterfalls, I generally want to capture the details of the waterfall. So one one sixtieth of a second plus, but it depends a little bit on your focal length. If you're zoomed in and the water is moving over your frame faster, fast shutter speed. For streams, especially streams in the front of the waterfall, then 1 60th to half a second, just like with the waves, works really, really well. If you want to learn more about composition in landscape photography, be sure to get my ebooks. If you want to learn how I edit my photos, be sure to sign up for my huge Photoshop for landscape photographers post processing course. There are links down in the description for the ebooks and the course, and remember to use the coupon code down in the description for the course to save a little bit of money. If you enjoyed this video, I would highly appreciate both a like and a comment, and share the video wherever it makes sense, and subscribe to watch even more.